This farm was always called Cedar Point Farm from the 1867 era in the courthouse records. I think all in all peanut production has been this very similar for the last 50, 75 years. When they subsidize us as farmers, uh, the government is also subsidizing you as a consumer. The old timers always said, uh, peanut has got to scare you to death to make you think it's not going to make a crop to make a big crop. Sir, we will not see you back there. Well, that's fine. Come no, over we can here. see you. No, 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 no. Come, come, come over here. here. This is my son, Jay Darden, my grandson, Brian Darden, and the other grandson, Adam Darden. This is my son, Les Everett. What has farming changed from the time your fathers were farming to what you're doing today? What are the changes? God. Where do you start? My father lived on the farm, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and that's as far back as I know, but they've all been farmers and they've all had sons, but when my parents had children, they had two girls. I decided that it was good for me to be on the farm. It, I love to be outside, I love farming, I love the smell of the soil, I love walk barefooted in the soil with the uh, soil coming between my toes. It's the best life could be. The Portuguese established colonies on the Brazilian coast. They were probably the first Europeans to, to see peanuts in cultivation. And they very soon took the peanuts back to Africa. The botanists, uh, archaeologists, and, and historians generally agree now that, that uh, the peanut came from, grew wild in, in Brazil. Uh, in, in ancient times. Peanuts was a highly valued crop uh, um, among the, the Incas uh, 2,000 years ago. Dr. Maneri had a clinic in Malawi and he's a uh, He's an amazing man, he's a problem solver, and he noticed the biggest problem in Malawi was starving children. So he developed a product that's basically 25% each, uh, peanuts, milk powder, vegetable oil, sugar. Uh, they give him three of these uh, 500 calorie sachets a day. At the end of six weeks, that kid's healthy. The success rate went from less than 25 to over 90%. Three years later, they've gone back, they're still healthy. And now it's considered an essential medicine by the World Health Organization. So it is, I don't know why, but it's, it's definitely a miracle. I mean, I asked 
my friend Dr. Maneri, if you tried something else, if you tried putting in, because there's all kinds of studies on black-eyed peas, sesame, chickpeas, everything. I said, have you tried anything else? He said, no, the kids vomit. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but that's not good. So peanuts have been uh, a part of culture for many thousands of years and an important part of the diet. No matter how, how good an industry is, you still have to work hard to be on top and be successful. Well, we will be celebrating our 100th anniversary next year. That will be 100 years from when my grandfather started the business in Cortland, Virginia. And unfortunately, it burned down very promptly after they uh, bought it. Mr. Obesey, the founder of Planters Peanuts, uh, called our family. Mr. Obesey said, don't rebuild in Cortland, Virginia. Why don't you come to Suffolk? Uh, that's what the family did, and that's the plant that is right here in Suffolk, and it's still a family business and still operating. We now handle about 30 percent of the peanuts in the United States because we're in all, all three regions. And the Southeast, which was the last operation we went into, is now our largest. Uh, we have, uh, we operate four shelling plants there and one here in Virginia and one in Texas. The sheller is the one that gets that raw peanut in a condition that's been cleaned and sized so that when that manufacturer gets it, he's ready to cook it and put it in his product. And the art of shelling is to knock the hole off but not break the peanut in half. Because Planners was here and because all these shelling plants were here, this area also attracted uh, peanut brokers and other allied manufacturers of peanut butter and peanut products. A peanut broker represents the sheller as a seller and sells to the manufacturer as a middleman. And he's paid by the sheller, but he has to have the manufacturer make the connection. In the peanut brokerage business, you develop relationships. And some companies, talking about my father and myself, we went through three and four generations of the family. And everything in Suffolk, uh, the homecoming here was peanut bowl. The annual was the peanut. And uh, this Suffolk was peanuts, and peanuts were Suffolk. The old motto for my high school, Suffolk High School, was I'm peanut bread, I'm peanut fed, when I'm gone, I'll be peanut dead. <laughs> proof of the pudding is that when I came there were 10 shelling plants in Suffolk and now we're the only one that's left. As a matter of fact, we're the only one left in the state of Virginia. In the 1900s, the peanut really came a cash crop for the farmer during the Depression. When I went to college, I went to NC State in, in ag and plant science, and uh, the lure of coming back, you know, was that. So, so I came back in the late 70s and, and farmed full time here um, until the mid 90s. It, invariably with a farmer, the difficulty is, is the fact that your commodity prices go up and down and you're at the whims of the buyers, which are pretty much a monopoly most of the time. Most years they are. It changes. And so you have peaks. In other words, your price goes up, it's above break-even point, and the next year it goes down, it's below break-even point. And it sits there. So it's peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. Unless you have an understanding banker, they're not going to let you get through that valley. They did offer us compensation for our quota poundage, which helped. It helped re-educate me. I diversified my farming by getting a business and law degree. Growing up on a farm, you were interested in getting on the tractor and doing something. 
when your daddy thought you were quite maybe big enough, or get you to do something to see how you get the feel of the tractor. Right now I have a son, him and I are, I guess what's said, partners. He's not a farm laborer, he's a farmer himself. Him and I work together like me and my dad work together. And if I reach an age where I feel like too much for me to handle or retirement, then hopefully I, his son would come on in with him and farm. So I come along when uh, things were done the old way and the hard way. Sometimes they do it at night, sit there and pick the penis off the vine. Bill of fire, and that was the light. And pick the penis off the vine, that's where the penis got harvested. Did you ever miss school in order to help with the crops when you were a boy? Miss school? Yes, ma'am. I missed a whole lot of school. And not only that, I remember, well, you asked a good question that time. Uh, I remember when the school closed at harvesting time. They closed it for a month. Because one enough children coming for the paid teacher come to the, to the school. So it wasn't no school for about a month. Mm -hmm. When you work a day, you put in a full day. You go to work when the sun comes up, and you don't quit until it gets dark. My mother had hot bread every meal during the week, except Sunday night for supper. We had hot biscuits and hot cornbread every meal. She'd get up and make cornbread and biscuits for breakfast every morning. My mother was strictly a kitchen person. No woman should be allowed to get married that didn't know how to cut up a chicken and clean fish. <laughs> Act like you love me, man. <laughs> Act like you didn't marry me for my money. <laughs> how long have you guys been married? How long? 15 It'd be 60 years come February. Wow. And did you court her on a mule? No, I did not. <laughs> no. I courted her on a pickup to start with. <laughs> a farm pickup, a white farm pickup. Dirty. <laughs> I don't have a wish about limiting what they can grow here on this farm. I just want them to keep it in the family if they will, because it's a great place. What they'll get, they'll get it from, from my children and will be passed on to their children. And I hope, uh, I hope they'll just understand that uh, he was a guy that loved the land. <laughs>